Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the first David Pines uh, Outreach Lecture in Physics. Uh, I am Piers Coleman, and I'm a co-director of the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter, which is based here at UC Davis. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, let me tell you a few things about David Pines before I introduce you to our speaker this evening. David Pines, uh, uh, who passed away uh, three years ago, uh, was a pioneer in the application of quantum mechanics to the problem of many body physics, which is the physics of many electrons and the emergent physics that they give rise to. Amongst the many things he did, he, did, he discovered the plasmon, which is a coherent fluctuation of the electron fluid. Uh, he was a uh, uh, professor of physics here at UC Davis for about 10 years, uh, from around 2000, what, 2002. Uh, and he founded the uh, Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter uh, that uh, is holding this lecture. Uh, I think that's enough to say about David. Uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Ina. Ina Vishik is a, uh, a professor at UC Davis, and uh, she has uh, 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 done her undergraduate work at Stanford University, uh, where uh, you may have seen the blurb. She discovered that in her childhood, that uh, uh, when she was a kid, she discovered that uh, uh, that uh, chemistry sets could blow things up, and uh, and this attracted her to the idea of physics. Anyway, she went on from her uh, PhD at Stanford uh, to a Papalado Fellowship at MIT uh, before uh, coming back to the West Coast, where he, she's been building up her lab at UC Davis. And she's going to tell us tonight about uh, the secret life of electrons. She's going to tell us about how you can probe novel materials uh, using a method called angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. And uh, without saying any more, I'm going to hand over to Ina and let her take the stage. Thank you so much, Ina, for coming this evening. I know it's been very difficult for you, um, and we're really delighted that you can still give your lecture. All right, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And let me share the screen. All right, can everyone, is this visible? Yes. Okay, good. And you can hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, very good. So um, let me uh, get uh, started then. Um, so uh, today I will be uh, discussing the secret life of electrons. So what electrons are doing in some of the novel uh, materials that are presently just being studied in the lab, but maybe in the future can uh, impact uh, technology. So I wanna begin uh, by going back, uh, way back, uh, to point out that human history is really the history of materials technology. So for example, in the distant age, uh, past, we had the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, which uh, represented uh, two eras in which humanity was able to harness uh, the useful properties of two new materials. In the more recent past, we had the Industrial Revolution, where a whole host of new materials were harnessed, so steel, copper, aluminum, uh, uh, reinforced concrete. And then after that, we had the Silicon Age, which gave rise to uh, the uh, computer technology that permeates our everyday world, including uh, what you're watching this talk on right now. And looking forward into the future, there are still uh, um, challenges that remain that can find solutions in new materials. So some examples of this uh, are quantum computing and technology, as well as renewable and clean energy. So I'm representing the physics and astronomy department at UC Davis. And physics is a very broad field that uh, covers many uh, realms of nature. So uh, for example, astrophysics is concerned with objects that are very large. 
And on the opposite uh, side of uh, things is particle physics, which uh, tries to understand matter by breaking it down into its smallest constituents. So my field is called condensed matter physics. And this field is, is, is uh, concerned with the physics of many. So what uh, new things occur when you have many uh, particles all uh, interacting with one another? So in physics, as well as probably other fields of inquiry as well, there's somewhat of a tension between two uh, competing approaches. So one approach is reductionism. So that is where you try to learn about, uh, about uh, something by breaking it down into its constituent parts. So you wanna learn about a bird, you dissect a bird, figure out where its organs are, how they fit together. I tried to find a photo that wasn't uh, so gruesome. On the opposite uh, 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 side of this uh, continuum is emergence. So emergence is the idea that more is different and the properties of a system that contains many particles or many actors uh, behaves very differently from a system that uh, uh, contains just one. An example of that with birds is that when you have a flock of some types of birds, they uh, exhibit uh, swarming and swooping uh, behavior. They uh, behave almost as if they're a unit, even though it's uh, made up of uh, individual uh, birds. So um, uh, in uh, condensed matter physics and especially modern implementations thereof, we tend to be more on the uh, emergent side of this uh, continuum. So with that being said, let me begin with a little bit of reductionism. So I will be uh, talking about electrons and electronic properties uh, today. So let me explain uh, some attributes of one uh, electron, a single electron, or two of them sometimes, that we'll be coming back to uh, throughout this talk. So one intrinsic definitional attribute of an electron is that it has charge. So a uh, charge uh, can be thought of as a property that's defined in relation to other particles that have charge. So for example, if you have two electrons, which each have a negative charge, they will repel one another. A similar uh, uh, sort of intrinsic property of electrons is a quantum mechanical property called spin. So unlike what the name implies, nothing is spinning. And uh, instead, uh, one can sort of uh, think of the property of spin as making each electron sort of like a teeny tiny bar magnet, where there's two configurations, one where the North Pole points up and one where the North Pole uh, points down. So analogous to charge, spin is kind of an intrinsic uh, property uh, that defines the particle called an electron. Spin is what uh, uh, imparts uh, magnetism to materials together with the orbital motion of electrons. And then finally, electrons also have mass. They have a very small amount of mass. So if you have an atom, uh, a typical atom, the electrons will constitute about 0.05% of the total mass and the nucleus will be 99.95%. So uh, the building blocks of condensed matter physics are atoms um, and atoms have a positively charged nucleus that is very small compared to the overall size of the atom. And then the uh, thing that determines the size of the atom is the electrons. Uh, electrons are delocalized into a sort of cloud um, and a characteristic size of an atom that varies from one atom to another, but just a general number is about uh, one angstrom or one ten billionth of a meter. So to construct an object of macroscopic uh, size, something you can see and, and feel with your hands uh, using atoms, you need billions and billions of atoms along each dimension. And then the atoms that we have to choose from to construct uh, uh, the systems that we study are the elements of the periodic table, or at least the ones that are not super radioactive and, and decay in a certain amount. So the stable uh, elements of the periodic table are our building blocks. 
So the uh, specific subfield of condensed matter that I'll be talking about today is called solid state physics. And this is concerned with objects that are solid. And uh, uh, additionally, usually we consider objects in which there is an orderly arrangement of atoms. So uh, such an object is called a crystal. So in colloquial speech, the word crystal sometimes means something that's sparkly or transparent, but in the context of solid state physics, a crystal just means that you have a regular arrangement of atoms. And of course, you can have more than one type of atom. Here is a uh, crystal uh, uh, of, of sodium chloride or table salt, uh, which has uh, two types of atoms arranged in an orderly way. So there are many different materials that we can construct using the elements of the periodic table. So how can we distinguish one material from another? What makes them different? So to illustrate that, I'm showing three different materials that visually kind of look uh, similar. So they're all sort of silvery and they're all kind of irregular. So one distinction between these silvery rocks is their uh, chemical composition. So what elements are they composed of? So the first one is uh, silicon. The second one is silver. And the uh, third one, it actually contains two elements. It contains iron and oxygen, and it's called magnetite. So this is actually a naturally occurring mineral, which was uh, the uh, uh, mineral by which humanity discovered the phenomenon of magnetism. So another way to distinguish one material from another is based on how its atoms arrange themselves in space. So all of these are crystals and their atoms form a regular arrangement. And the uh, building blocks of that regular arrangement are these little uh, cube shaped objects uh, called uh, unit cells. And inside of these cubes for each of these uh, rocks, uh, the uh, elements are arranged in space a little bit differently. Sometimes this uh, arrangement is uh, a little bit complicated as it is for magnetite, uh, but it is still regular when you repeat this cube over and over again in space. And finally, we can define materials in terms of what they do. So for example, silicon is a semiconductor. If you don't know what that means, I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, silver is a metal. It's actually the most uh, conductive metal that uh, 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 among elements of the periodic table. Uh, we just don't wire our houses with it because it is uh, expensive and it corrodes. And finally, magnetite, it has a number of things we can say about it. So it's magnetic, as I mentioned, and it sort of has a split personality. So at low temperature, it is an insulator. And then above 120 Kelvin and also at room temperature, it is a metal. So everything in this last column is a statement about what electrons in the material are doing. And electrons are very important for uh, harnessing uh, useful things out of materials. So uh, to illustrate this, I'm showing two uh, circuits with uh, different materials uh, inside uh, the circuit. So in the first one, we have a nail, which is made out of metal. And when you have a, a nail inside your circuit, then electrons are free to flow in the wire and through the nail, and the light bulb lights up. On the other hand, if we put an insulator in that circle, uh, in that circuit rather, uh, like a ceramic mug, the electrons will get stuck on this uh, mug and they will not be able to traverse the circuit and the uh, light bulb does not light up. So, um, one uh, definition in that sense, uh, distinguishing a metal from an insulator, is that in a metal, electrons are free to move, but in an insulator, there's a large energy barrier for electrons to move. So this can be uh, 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 drawn in the following way. So insulators, they have a large energy barrier for electrons to move. So you put it in the circuit, the light bulb does not light up. Semiconductors have a smaller energy barrier. So you put it in the circuit, it depends what temperature and what composition of the semiconductor, whether uh, the electrons move. And then finally, metals have no barrier. So electrons are free to move. 
So all of the types of, of materials that I mentioned so far, so insulators, metals, and semiconductors, they are the building blocks of our uh, technology. So this picture here is uh, a uh, schematic of a transistor similar to the ones uh, found in our computers and other devices. So it uh, contains uh, metals in the source gate and drain. There's an insulator uh, right here between the gate and the body of the, the device. And then the body of the device is constructed from semiconductors where the N and the P uh, denotes the uh, predominant charge, uh, sign of the charge carriers in those regions, N being negative and P uh, being positive. So these uh, types of materials that we understand very well, um, they have uh, served us very well in our technology and continue to serve us well, but there are challenges on the horizon. So in terms of classical computing, so that's the, the device that you're watching this, this talk on, there are challenges with continued uh, miniaturization. These include bumping up into the limits of quantum mechanics, but it also uh, includes a more uh, uh, basic uh, difficulty of as you get more and more uh, uh, transistors in a smaller area, heating becomes a, a larger and larger concern as you uh, attempt to manipulate information. Uh, moving forward into the future, quantum computing and sensing are growing areas. And although there are uh, purported existing quantum computers, uh, it is thought that other material solutions might be able to uh, do it better. Um, going now into energy, that is another sector where uh, innovations in materials can help us out. So many of the uh, sources of clean energy have some associated materials component. And this is a statement very broadly, uh, including uh, solar, where the photovoltaic cells are literally a, a semiconductor, uh, fuel cells, um, as well as nuclear. And then additionally, um, on the energy storage and transmission, uh, there are also uh, materials that can solve our issues there. So, specifically for, uh, uh, for sources of energy that are produced far away from population uh, centers. One needs to be able to transport uh, that uh, energy without losing uh, a lot of it. Um, and uh, uh, additionally for intermittent uh, sources of energy, it's desirable to store it when the energy is being produced. Uh, so you have it for when you need it. So these are just a couple of, of uh, technological challenges on the horizon. And to find solutions uh, to them, uh, it is probably not fruitful to iterate on the solutions that we presently have, but instead consider completely uh, different uh, materials approaches. So one place where we might find uh, materials that solve some of these problems is in uh, so-called quantum materials. So I want to begin by giving some examples of unusual things that some quantum materials do. So there are some quantum materials in which electrons behave like light. So I mentioned earlier that electrons have a property called a, a, a mass. So they have uh, some, some, some weight to them. On the other hand, light does not have mass. But in some materials, electrons actually behave like light. They behave like they don't have mass. On the opposite side of things, there are some materials in which uh, electrons behave like they have a lot of mass, a lot more mass than a free electron uh, in space. Uh, so they behave uh, like their electrons are very heavy. Um, one uh, type of material that I'll talk about later is materials that sort of have a split personality. So they're a metal on the surface, but an insulator in the interior. And another type of material that I'll talk about is a uh, superconductor. And specifically, some quantum materials have uh, superconductivity in uh, scenarios where we normally do not expect uh, to find superconductors. So these are just a couple of examples of novel phenomena in quantum materials. So where do quantum materials get their unique behaviors? Uh, broadly speaking, there are two uh, avenues for these uh, unique behaviors. 
So some uh, quantum materials derive their interesting properties uh, because the repulsion between electrons cannot be ignored. So um, electrons are uh, negatively charged uh, particles. And when you have many of them, they should uh, all repel uh, one another. However, in many materials that we understand very well using 20th century physics, such as the copper wires in our house, um, one reason that we understand them so well is because this repulsion between electrons, it can be ignored. It can be ignored because the energy associated with that repulsion is just so much smaller than the energy associated with the electron's motion. Uh, another source for uh, emergent behaviors in uh, quantum materials is materials in which the geometry of the many electron wave function is uh, important. And the field of quantum materials is broadly um, uh, uh, governed by the idea that uh, emergent phenomena uh, 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 dominate uh, over uh, reductionist ones. So they tend to be materials in which more is different. All right, so the field of quantum materials is really, sorry, is really um, a, an area of, of fundamental science. So we are interested in, in learning uh, general truths of what happens when you have many uh, particles in a crystalline solid all interacting with one another. So we're interested in identifying new materials, new phenomena in existing materials, as well as completely new paradigms for um, realizing uh, uh, new paradigms of electronic phenomena. We are also interested in understanding. We're interested in understanding why materials behave as they do, how to make them behave better, how to, how to optimize their use properties, and how to do things uh, completely uh, differently. So how to uh, achieve a uh, similar uh, end result, a similar uh, behavior by a completely different uh, physical mechanism. So these two, uh, um, uh, these two aspects of the field uh, feed uh, on each other. And um, out of this process of finding uh, fundamental uh, truths, we can also uh, get uh, some uh, uh, results that are useful for technology. And additionally, we can get results that are useful for other fields of science. So for example, for creating uh, detectors for experiments in other fields of science. So for um, all of this, the electrons behavior in these quantum materials is key to identifying and understanding how uh, uh, the nature of the material. So um, one very fundamental uh, property uh, of moving objects is energy versus momentum, and this is called a dispersion relation. So this property applies even to large classical objects, so I'll introduce it there. So if we think of like a baseball that we throw or a planet, just something macroscopic we can see, then uh, the energy of its motion is called its kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy is related to its momentum via this expression. So it goes as momentum squared divided by twice the mass. And the important part of this uh, expression is uh, the momentum squared part. So for these large uh, classical objects, the energy goes uh, quadratically as the momentum. So it turns out that sometimes electrons behave the same way. So sometimes electrons behave like baseballs. Uh, for some uh, materials, uh, the uh, energy of the uh, electrons goes as their momentum squared. And this is sort of a uh, typical uh, dispersion relation of electrons. However, in many quantum materials, the uh, dispersion relation is either more complicated or just different from this uh, simple case of, of uh, quadratic behavior. So some examples of this are given below. And again, the examples that I will show are sort of unique uh, fingerprints of different types of materials, different types of electronic behavior in those materials. So for example, if we have a material in which electrons behave like light, then the electron's energy 
uh, does not go quadratically with momentum, but it goes uh, linearly with momentum. It's equal to momentum times some constant. If we have a material in which the electrons are very heavy, uh, you see that mass is in the denominator here. So if you have very heavy electrons, you have a very smushed flat uh, parabola. And then uh, another example that I'll give is if you have a superconductor, one characteristic uh, fingerprint of a superconductor is that it also has an energy barrier, uh, uh, similar, uh, but, but definitely not the same as uh, an insulator or a semiconductor. And I'll explain a little bit later the physical origin of, of this uh, energy barrier. So these uh, energy versus momentum relations uh, are a microscopic way of distinguishing one material uh, from another and also realizing materials uh, useful uh, properties. And it can be measured. So it is measured using the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is what Einstein got his Nobel prize for. And it is a uh, photon or light in and then electron out uh, process. So you shine light, uh, UV light or X-ray light on a material. Um, in high school, you might have been told that the material has to be a metal, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so you shine light on this material. And then if the light is energetic enough, then an electron is ejected. Uh, and these electrons that are ejected, they used to be inside the material. They used to be moving inside the material. And it turns out that after they are ejected, they're still carrying information about how they were moving in the material. And that can be measured using uh, the technique of angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. So this technique is the photoelectric effect plus angular resolution. And from there, we learn how electrons uh, move. So what we physically measure, so we shine light on a material, electrons are ejected, and then we measure those electrons very carefully. Specifically, we measure their energy and we measure their emission angle. We measure the angle with which they fly off uh, from the material. And it turns out that that is related to the energy and the momentum that they had uh, back inside the material. So by using the photoelectric effect plus very careful uh, measurement, we can learn the characteristic uh, 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 fingerprint of how electrons move in different uh, materials. So uh, this is a uh, schematic of the experiment. And then this is uh, our system in our lab at UC Davis. Uh, this, the uh, dome shaped uh, uh, thing is the business end of the machine. It's what actually uh, measures the electrons very carefully. And that's uh, this uh, component uh, over here. All right. So the, I, the, the purpose of doing these experiments is that the unique electronic fingerprint of electrons and materials has uh, direct implications to that material's functionality. So we have uh, some uh, materials um, in, uh, in uh, this field. Usually the specimens that we study are uh, grown in the lab. Usually they're not found uh, in nature. And usually instead of being big rocks, they're little tiny rocks, typically about a millimeter uh, in size. So we have uh, materials. And then using a machine like this, we can measure the unique electronic uh, fingerprints uh, of that material. And from there, we can learn a whole lot. Uh, so we can learn what type of uh, material is this uh, exactly, sort of like distinguishing between a metal insulator and semiconductor. But with quantum materials, we have a whole host of other uh, possible uh, characterizations, classifications of materials to consider. Uh, we can use this to determine uh, or help determine why a material has uh, the properties uh, that it does. And we can also use it uh, to uh, predict how this material will behave. So if we put it in a circuit, what will it do? Um, so, um, all right. So uh, uh, um, quantum materials is a, again, I wanna emphasize a fundamental uh, science. So um, one uh, aspect of that is that we are not wedded to a specific solution to a given problem. 
uh, in contrast, we uh, have the opportunity in a fundamental science to uh, explore a number of different possible solutions. And I want to illustrate that point uh, for the rest of the talk. I, I hope to show you that uh, for uh, technological challenges, there are often multiple uh, material solutions that come at the problem completely differently. So um, let's uh, pose uh, a, a problem that we want to solve. So how to make a more conductive metal. So we have our circuit with our wire and our light bulb. And let's say we want uh, to be able to run this uh, light bulb for a longer amount of time uh, without draining the battery. Or we want the wire to not heat, heat, up, heat up as much. We want a better metal. So um, uh, some realistic applications of a better metal uh, can be viewed on uh, two vastly different uh, length scales. So one application is for computing and even classical uh, computing. So basically um, uh, diminishing the amount of heating that is created in the process of, of doing uh, computations with better uh, metallic interconnects. On the other length scale, the very large length scale, um, we are interested in, for example, uh, 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 less lossy uh, power lines such that energy created far away from population centers can get to population centers without uh, being uh, completely lost. Okay, so let's uh, discuss um, what is presently used in both of those applications. And what is used is metals, either copper or gold. Um, and in a metal, the reason that it has uh, some uh, resistance to current flow is because of a process called scattering. So uh, when an electron uh, attempts to move in a metal, and this is uh, just uh, an illustration, um, it bumps into things uh, that uh, prevent it from getting where it wants to go as fast. So it can bump into impurities. So for this copper wire, uh, some little trace elements that are not uh, copper, uh, or it bumps into vibration of atoms or it bumps into other electrons, but uh, long story short, it bumps into stuff. And that is what uh, causes uh, uh, some losses when you run a, a current. So an analogy to this bumping process is one that'll probably make you guys cringe uh, in the present uh, day and age. But let's say you have, uh, you're in a crowded subway station and you want to get from where you are to your next train. So there are lots of people and they're all moving around in random directions. So as you attempt to traverse the crowd, you will bump into a lot of people. So one way to uh, make yourself uh, get where you're going faster is to remove some of these people. So impose some sort of social distancing. So removing those people is sort of analogous to removing some of the impurities here. So you have fewer people to bump into. Another strategy to get through the crowd quicker is to just make everyone freeze. So there's still a lot of people, but uh, you can navigate them more uh, readily. And making all the people freeze is analogous to uh, cooling down your material to uh, minimize the scattering process. So this is the idea if we have a uh, uh, metal that is presently used uh, for, uh, for the uh, application stated, but can we get a more conductive material? So there are many ways to do this and I'll uh, discuss two of them. So one way is a superconductor and another way is something else where scattering is minimized. I'll come back to how this can be done later, but let's begin now with a superconductor. So let me begin that with uh, explaining what is a superconductor. So a superconductor is a uh, macroscopic quantum coherent uh, ground state. It's a very uh, specific uh, uh, state of many quantum particles, but it has two macroscopic observables, two things that happen on a large uh, scale. So the first macroscopic observable, and that's the one that is useful for the present discussion, is that uh, the resistance goes to zero below some critical temperature called Tc. So the resistance in a superconductor when it's below Tc 
is uh, exactly zero. So if you want a better metal, a more conductive metal, this is as conductive as you can get. The other macroscopic observable of a superconductor is that it expels its magnetic field. So in this uh, picture here, the thing that is seen most prominently is actually not the superconductor, it's a magnet that's floating above the superconductor and the superconductor itself is the gray disc that is a little bit obscured uh, below. So those are the things that happen on a large scale, but then if we zoom down uh, uh, to a much smaller scale and ask what's happening microscopically, um, a couple of things are happening. So in a superconductor, the charge carrier unit is not a single electron as it is in an ordinary metal, but instead it is a pair of electrons called a Cooper pair. And then all of these Cooper pairs, they are all uh, talking to each other and they are uh, coherent with one another. Um, uh, one analogy of this is if you have a row of ice skaters um, and they're all uh, holding hands, if one of them uh, tips uh, over, then its two neighbors can just uh, hoist them up. And similarly in a superconductor, the Cooper pairs are behaving uh, cooperatively to uh, give rise to these macroscopic observables. So um, there are generally speaking two types of superconductors. So the first category is superconductors we understand. And what that means is we know why they become superconducting. There's a microscopic mechanism of how the electrons end up uh, binding up into Cooper pairs in those materials. And um, some examples of superconductors we understand are some of the elements of the periodic table that become superconducting. Unfortunately, for the superconductors we understand, they either have really low TC, low superconducting transition temperatures, or they require very high pressure. So they're not as practical. On the opposite side of things are superconductors we don't understand where we have hope for making a more uh, useful uh, superconductor. An example of a superconductor that we don't understand is actually the one in this photo. It is a copper oxide uh, material that I'll be discussing in a little bit. So in the category of superconductors that we don't understand are many different uh, types of quantum materials uh, that um, are composed of different uh, elements and have very different uh, transition temperatures. So um, this includes uh, copper oxide materials that have TCs on the order of 100 Kelvin, um, iron-based materials, which have a TC a factor of two or three lower. Um, there are some materials that have the heavy electrons that also become uh, superconducting. And more recently, a new uh, addition to this family has been actually a uh, 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 graphene, which is single layers of graphite. This is a material characterized by light-like electrons, but if you put two of them together and twist them a little bit, um, then it turns out uh, to be a superconductor. And these are just a couple of examples. There are many more materials in this family. Um, and although they have a very different chemical composition, very different TC, we still uh, study them in concert with one another because they have many common themes. So one of the common themes is that superconductivity exists in strange places, strange relative to the superconductors we understand. So this includes in conjunction with magnetism, in uh, correlated electron uh, materials, that means the repulsion between electrons cannot be ignored, and also in proximity to uh, insulators. And another common theme is that we don't understand why uh, they become superconducting. And this is one question that can help us, uh, if it's answered, can help us create materials that have higher TC at ambient pressure. So I'm gonna focus on copper oxide uh, materials uh, for now because they start off with the highest TC. So if we want a useful superconductor, this is perhaps our best hope. So uh, to reach 100 Kelvin, the cryogen that is used is liquid nitrogen. Um, liquid nitrogen is actually a very cheap and abundant cryogen. So most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And 100 Kelvin might sound very cold to you guys, but to a physicist, 100 Kelvin is toasty warm. It is a warm bubble bath. It is hot, hot, hot. So um, if you have strange inclinations, this is a high temperature. 
All right. So I want to discuss some of the things we can learn by uh, measuring the characteristic uh, fingerprints of electrons in these copper oxide materials. So one characteristic uh, fingerprint uh, in a superconductor is the energy it takes to break apart a Cooper pair. So I mentioned earlier that in a superconductor, there's this characteristic energy barrier. And in a superconductor, this characteristic energy barrier, what it represents is the energy that it takes to break apart a Cooper pair and make these uh, electrons just be single electrons as in an ordinary metal. So in these copper oxide materials, it turns out that this energy barrier is uh, different in different uh, directions. And because uh, momentum is a vector, this also tells you that it is different uh, as has some uh, momentum dependence. And this characteristic momentum dependence um, can narrow down the uh, uh, potential reason why they become superconductive. I should mention that for superconductors that we do understand, the energy barrier to break up a Cooper pair is the same in every direction. Another thing that we can uh, learn by measuring uh, the characteristic fingerprint is how fast electrons are moving in these superconductors and what uh, slows uh, them down. So to do this, here's an energy versus momentum uh, measurement uh, from, from my group of uh, copper oxide material. And the key thing is that in this plot of energy versus momentum, the slope is related to velocity. So uh, over here where the slope is largest, electrons are moving fastest. Over here, they're moving slower. And then over here where the slope is smallest, they're moving the slowest. And there are two characteristic energies where the electrons suddenly slow down. Uh, what we think is causing this slowing down is uh, actually the atoms uh, vibrating around. And we also find that this uh, characteristic slowing down tends to be uh, greater in materials that have a larger superconductive transition temperature. So potentially atomic vibrations could be a means of enhancing superconductivity, not the reason that it exists to begin with, but if you have a superconductor, they can be a way of making the transition temperature uh, higher. And finally, another approach to understanding why these materials become uh, superconducting is learning what they're doing when they're not superconducting. To do this, we can look at a what's called a phase diagram, which describes what electrons are doing as a function of temperature and composition in sort of a graphical and schematic way. So for copper oxide materials, at some compositions, they behave like magnets. So this is going back to the point where that many of these unusual superconductors have superconductivity in conjunction or nearby to, and, uh, to magnetism and also insulating uh, phases. Um, then over here in the red, this is where it's actually uh, superconducting. And if we uh, uh, sit somewhere on this red uh, region and then raise the temperature, we end up in this blue region, which is called the pseudo gap. So the pseudo gap is something that we really don't understand yet. So we don't understand in these copper oxide materials what electrons are actually doing uh, when they are uh, not uh, superconducting. By measuring the characteristic fingerprints, we know that a characteristic of this uh, strange uh, phase is that electrons moving in some directions behave like semiconductors, but electrons moving in other directions uh, behave like metals. So this is one of the major uh, challenges in, in the field uh, to try and figure out what is this so-called normal state of, of uh, electrons in the copper oxide materials. So uh, it, to, uh, uh, so uh, to summarize this uh, section, so superconducting quantum materials remain an active area of, of research because of the questions that still remain. And one uh, approach that helps us move forward is the fact that we have so many materials that uh, exhibit sort of uh, analogous or very similar uh, phenomena. So uh, understanding the common threads in these different uh, materials is something that can really uh, converge uh, uh, us faster to a solution and help us develop a higher temperature superconductor. Okay, 
So um, with, uh, with, uh, with superconductors, we can get a better metal. Uh, it has to be a little bit cold. Uh, so some people don't like that. So if you are someone that prefers to be at room temperature, then we need to consider other solutions. So let's discuss the other side of this slide uh, now for the rest of the talk, um, something where scattering is minimized. So this uh, approach, it is uh, focusing on what are called uh, topological uh, quantum materials. And I'll come to what that means in a little bit. Okay, so before I do that, let me sort of recap some of the characteristics of ordinary materials, ordinary metals. So electrons in those ordinary materials, they behave like classical objects. So uh, energy goes quadratically with momentum. Um, sometimes electrons on the surface behave differently from electrons in the bulk because the surface uh, is sort of a different environment than the interior. And this, the electrons on the surface, they're called surface states, but in ordinary materials, these surface states are easily destroyed. So you come in with your molecular hammer, it's not a real hammer, it has to do something at the atomic scale, but you have a molecular hammer and you can destroy this, uh, whatever is happening on the surface. So if you like what the electrons at the surface are doing, too bad, it's gone. Um, and then finally, um, electrons can scatter off uh, impurities. And again, this is what uh, contributes to the resistivity of uh, ordinary metals. So, um, so uh, in topological uh, quantum materials, electrons sometimes behave uh, differently. And the reason for this is that, uh, uh, that uh, geometric properties sometimes can make electrons follow uh, different rules. So one way to, um, to illustrate this is with a Mobius strip. So um, if you played with this uh, type of thing as a kid, great. Um, if you haven't, basically um, to make an ordinary loop, you just take either a strip of paper or this uh, little bracelet that I took from my niece and you just uh, make an ordinary uh, loop, an ordinary little bracelet out of it. Make a Mobius strip, you first uh, make a twist and then put the bracelet together. There you go. Okay, so now let's uh, consider these two objects that, that have a different uh, geometry and ask what happens when you sort of uh, perform the same operation. So let's say we are going to go on the edge of this loop and we're going to traverse 360 degrees. Okay, we're going to make a circle. So in an ordinary loop, you make a circle along one edge, you come back to where you came from. Um, now for a Mobius strip, if you do that same procedure, you follow the edge and traverse 360 degrees, you actually end up at the opposite edge of the, uh, of the uh, strip. So similarly, um, electrons, when they are uh, confined to uh, obey uh, different uh, geometric properties, they can behave uh, differently. Um, so in these so-called uh, um, topological quantum materials, uh, phenomena different from the basic metals can occur. So for example, it is one way that you can get light-like uh, electrons. Um, you can get robust and sometimes unusual surface and edge states. Um, robust means that the molecular hammer is not going to uh, destroy it. So if you have a three-dimensional material, the surface is a two-dimensional object. If you have a two-dimensional material, the area inside is, is the interior, and then the perimeter is the uh, edge or boundary. And then uh, uh, in some of these materials, there are some types of scattering that are uh, disallowed, and specifically uh, backscattering, which is like a U-turn. So if you think about trying to traverse that uh, crowd of people, um, if you sort of make small uh, deviations from your forward trajectory, you're still going to where you want to go. But if you bump into someone and you have and you end up going backwards, that is uh, really catastrophic uh, for getting where you need to go. So similarly, um, uh, backscattering is uh, the uh, main uh, contributor to uh, resistance in ordinary metals. And some topological quantum materials actually uh, disallow backscattering. Okay. 
So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, topological insulators, which uh, are uh, materials with a split uh, personality. So here's a photo of a topological insulator. It's a little uh, silver uh, rock. And this is actually a material that you might have in your house um, because it is a material that is used in thermoelectric. So materials where when you apply a, a voltage, it creates a temperature gradient or other way around, you have a temperature gradient and you create electricity that way. But um, this is a material that is used in some devices, including thermoelectric coolers. But um, decades after that was uh, found out, we found a completely new aspect of these materials that they were so-called uh, topological insulators. So the characteristics of a topological insulator is that in its bulk, it is an insulator. So in three dimensions, that means inside the box and in two dimensions, uh, inside this gray uh, rectangle. And there is a robust uh, surface state. So either on the surface of this cube or on the perimeter of this uh, plane. And this robust uh, surface state is not readily destroyed by your molecular hammer. So um, it is uh, it sticks around uh, under most uh, things that you could uh, dump on the surface to try and, and destroy it. And importantly, these phenomena are realized in ambient conditions. It's realized at room temperature, and there's no other uh, uh, lab thing that you do that is that you can't really do in, in the real world, like a magnetic field or high pressure. All right. So uh, topological insulators, like other quantum materials, have a unique uh, characteristic uh, electronic structure that is readily measured with angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. So on the left, I have the data. On the right, I have the schematic. And they both uh, indicate light-like electrons at the surface. Experimentally, we can tell they come from the surface by using different energies of light photo emission. And then in the bulk, there is an energy barrier, uh, which is uh, in the schematic, the uh, uh, distance from the bottom of this rounded cone here to the top of this rounded cone uh, here. So these are the characteristic fingerprints. And additionally, in the schematic, you see these arrows. And these arrows are something called spin momentum locking, which uh, is key to getting a better metal. So spin momentum locking means that electrons moving in a specific direction have a specific uh, spin state. So here it is sketched in two and three dimensions, but let me illustrate that here. So, um, uh, so in this uh, phenomenon of spin momentum locking, um, electrons with that are spin up, they can move in this drawing um, right and only right, and spin down can move left and only left. This is sort of analogous to a highway. So in a highway, you go very fast and you can only go one way on one side of the road and the other way on the other side of the road. So it turns out that this special rule that electrons have to follow in, in these materials is key to getting a better metal. So let's say an electron is moving along and then there is some obstruction in its path. So something you don't want on the road, a thumbtack, um, an impurity in the case of a, a material. So um, in an ordinary material, this electron would scatter back. It would uh, go uh, right in this drawing. However, um, according to the rules of this material, the electron cannot go right. It has to go left because of its spin. So it just goes around the impurity and continues uh, on its way. So um, it is by this uh, method of limiting the scattering that, uh, that uh, topological quantum materials and specifically some types of topological insulators can uh, uh, give you a better metal. But there is more. And one really interesting thing about uh, topological insulators is that they can be functionalized to do even more things. So uh, throughout this talk, I've been talking about sort of what one material uh, uh, can do on its own. But a, a common theme of, of research these days is what happens when materials join forces. So what happens when you combine two materials 
and, uh, and sort of uh, uh, use their properties collectively at the interface between them. So for topological insulators, one thing that you can do is combine it with a magnet. So put a magnet on top, and this gives a completely uh, different uh, uh, quantum state called the quantum anomalous Hall uh, insulator. So uh, instead of having the two opposite channels that electrons can move, there's only uh, one channel in this uh, type of material. Uh, another thing that one can do is put a superconductor and a topological insulator together. And this combination is something that may harbor new uh, types of particles called Majorana fermions. And um, this may be a platform for uh, topological quantum computing, which is thought to be more uh, fault tolerant than existing quantum computers. So this uh, is still in the realm of basic science, but potentially uh, uh, in the future, if we can uh, get this to work and, uh, and uh, uh, correct the subsequent engineering challenges, uh, it can really uh, drive uh, quantum uh, information to a, a new level. So um, I'm coming to the end, and I just want to uh, say that uh, quantum materials uh, um, uh, yield a variety of phenomena, and as a result, they can provide many distinct solutions to a given technological challenge. So I gave the example of making a better uh, metal or making a more conductive metal, and there are two very different uh, approaches there. So one can use a superconductor or one can use a topological quantum material. And the mechanism by which these two approaches uh, achieve a, a better metal is completely different. So for superconductors, it relies on the uh, coherence of many particles, uh, whereas for the topological material, it relies on different rules that electrons follow, namely uh, no U-turns. So, um, now uh, I'm really at the end. So let me conclude uh, with the following. So uh, materials uh, permeate our everyday life and they continue to be a source of new discoveries in fundamental science. And in those materials, electrons uh, determine many of their unique and useful properties. And every material has a unique uh, electronic fingerprint that is readily measured by angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy. Uh, quantum materials uh, provide a variety of unusual electronic phenomena with a common theme of emergence. More is different. And um, many uh, times there are multiple uh, material solutions to uh, engineering uh, challenges, which highlights the, the power of a fundamental science, which uh, can uh, discover and identify all of these different uh, ways of creating a new quantum matter. So with that, I'm done. And I really want to thank you for your attention. Okay, let's uh, give Ina a big hand for a wonderful talk. And uh, Ina, will you be happy to answer some questions? Of course. Okay. Uh, can I invite questions from those of you who've attended the talk? You can put your hand up in the reaction. Uh, in, in the reactions, you can raise your hand if you'd like to. If it's all clear, that's fine. Or another option as you can type into the chat. Yeah. Everyone is being very quiet. I think someone has their hand raised. There we go. Sing Yi Lai. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. So, uh, so for a topological insulator, if I happen to get one, can I tell that it's a topological insulator instead of just a normal metal? Um. Uh, can you tell uh, by uh, looking at it or by... Like, what uh, should I do to know it is not a normal man? Um, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. So, um, yeah, so how do you tell it is not a uh, normal metal? So one way is to measure its uh, characteristic energy versus uh, momentum relations. Um, but the uh, great thing about uh, condensed matter is that there's uh, uh, there's not 
one experiment that we that we do. So it's a field where we really have uh, contributions from many different uh, experiments. So uh, the fact that it's a topological insulator and has a characteristic electronic structure that will manifest in how it behaves uh, when you uh, when you run a current through it, at least if it's an ideal topological insulator, it will manifest in its uh, response to light, not necessarily visible light that we can see, but uh, but uh, infrared uh, wavelengths that we don't see. And there's uh, a whole host of other uh, experimental signatures. So most of these are not something you could do at home. They're sort of things that are done in lab, but there are many other uh, experimental signatures in addition to its uh, uh, distinct uh, 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 fingerprint of energy versus momentum relation. So uh, you mentioned that the defense on the Topological insulator is not that important because the electron can somehow go around the defects. Most types and, of defects, yes. So it means that the thermal effect will be very small, right? Uh, the thermal effect? Like for a normal conductor, if we apply a current on it, there's going to be some heat dissipation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I remember some talk mentioned that there's no heat dissipation in topological insulator. Um, so there's there's less if you have a three dimensional uh, topological insulator. If you have a two dimensional one with the edge uh, channels, it's very small uh, indeed. If it's an ideal uh, material. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? If you didn't understand something, please ask a question. Well, it seems like our audience is very shy and maybe it's getting late. So I think in that case, let's all thank Ina one last time. Uh, thanks so much for giving us this talk this evening. It's really wonderful. And uh, Thank you everyone for coming to this evening's talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, what you learned. That was well attended. Yeah, thank you, Ina, that was really Ina. nice. It, it was, was very, very nice. I'm happy uh, to do it. Thanks for, for asking me. Yeah, we would have much preferred it in person, of course, but it was great sure. anyway. Yeah, you had a good audience there. It hit 63 people, um, uh, which is excellent, given it was entirely online. Um, and I think we all enjoyed it. Uh, I like the way you presented the timeline at the beginning and uh, uh, introduced the different types of it summarize what electrons do at the beginning. That was really good. That was, that was great. Uh, gave a foundation for the rest of the talk. Well, good. Everyone has gone home. And uh, I guess that's the thing for us to do too. <laughs> when do you think you'll be back to the States, Ina? Um, um, we're planning on flying on Wednesday. We'll see when if oh, our good. last family member can get a negative test by then. Oh, wow. Okay. Nice Good luck with yeah. that. Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, safe yeah. trip. If anyone has tips how to, <laughs> how to get the, the good snot that's negative. <laughs> I'm glad you've got a good sense of humor about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, good night, everyone. And uh, uh, I guess, guess we'll, many of us will be here tomorrow at nine o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye, okay, everyone. Bye -bye.